All right. Good morning, everybody. This is the uh, White Plains City School District reopening committee meeting, special meeting uh, for March 3rd. Remember, we're uh, every two weeks. So uh, we're meeting today for, uh, to provide you with an update on where we are with regard to uh, our uh, White Plains comeback plans. And, um, and then, of course, we'll meet next week as, as regularly scheduled uh, also. So uh, and then we'll decide if we need to meet, um, you know, the following week, too. But um, just a, just a, a couple of things real quick out of the gate. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for everything that you, you continue to do. The update today will be uh, pretty much uh, straightforward from Dr. Hand and I. But before we start going through that, I do want to make sure that um, anybody who has any questions, comments, or concerns about anything not related to um, phasing that, that wants to bring up to the committee, please feel free to do so uh, right now. All good? Okay, so um, let me share my screen. I actually have a little something. So we're a year now. Um, uh, it's it's hard to believe, but we're we're a year now from when we uh, when we started first dealing with COVID nineteen in our region. Um, it's uh, unbelievable when you think about how far we've all come as a community, not just uh, White Plains, but also as a as a county community and, and a state community. Uh, this time last year, we didn't know uh, a whole lot about what was happening around us, um, and we were learning every single day something new. And unfortunately, sometimes things that we thought we were learning that were correct were incorrect. And we kind of went through that process um, all, all throughout the, the, the last year. What's really, um, what strikes me when I think back on it is how accustomed we have become to being able to look up the quote unquote answer to anything. And so we found ourselves um, a generation of folks for the first time in a long time where we actually didn't have the answers and we had to find um, the answers to the questions and we had to work through the challenges uh, that, that were facing us each day. And it, and it really does strike me as, you know, we talk a, a great deal about the importance of our students being able to um, problem solve and being able to deal with challenging situations for which perhaps there's no precedent and innovate a way through. Um, and, you know, we've done that. And, and of course, not just us, but um, we as a, as a country, um, as a, a global society, we, we have done that. And I, I think that's an awesome thing. And I mean, awesome as in like big and grand and just amazing. And I think it's something that we have to recognize as imperfect as, you know, the process has been or imperfect as um, things have been, and, and, and certainly as tragic as things have been for so many of us uh, in so many ways, we have come a really long way. Uh, our community, and I've said it a million times, I'll say it again, you know, our, our educational community, our greater community is, uh, in my view, just uh, amazing. Uh, we've, we, we've benefited from the support of folks who have allowed us to do this work, um, who have supported us, and uh, who have recognized that we don't have answers and we're developing, developing them and, and, and figuring them out along the way. And we've really been blessed with that. Um, we've also been blessed with the resilience of our children uh, and, and most importantly, the resilience of, I think, our faculty and staff members. Uh, these are folks who, you know, none of us did, right, of course, but these are folks who didn't sign up to figure out a brand new way um, to deliver education, and they did it. Um, and it, you can watch the, the progression and the growth and the, the development of the innovation all along the way. And for those of us who have been neck deep in it uh, for a, a full year, it, it really is when you take a step back. Um, it's, it's, a tremendous, it's a tremendous effort and uh, really do want to share thanks and appreciation to everybody uh, for everything that they've done, but also what they continue to do that helps move us forward. And that's, you know, we've tried to approach this as a partnership. And uh, this, this has been a situation where hearing from more voices helps us. Um, we don't always agree uh, and we can't always solve every problem, uh, but hearing from, you know, getting feedback from our community has uh, been really advantageous for us, I think, as we've been planning. So we're ready to start talking about our next steps. 
uh, together. And uh, this to me is really a cause for celebration. Um, but the pandemic's not over, Joe. Yeah, I know. I, I know the pandemic's not over. Uh, but the celebration is the, uh, the, the fact that we have been able to overcome some pretty significant challenges. Um, first, the vaccine. To, to have available to us a vaccine that is so effective for this particular virus in less than a year's time, and for many of the community members uh, in, in, our, in our district who have already been fully vaccinated, uh, I cannot understate how so important that was for us to be able to get to the next step in the conversation. What did you see last night? You saw the Biden administration prioritize educators for vaccine across the country. Well, this reopening committee has been yelling about that since, uh, since the, the, the vaccine became available to the public. Why? Because we knew, we knew that if we truly wanted to move in the direction of being able to safely welcome our children back to fully to school, that would be a priority that needed to be fulfilled. In White Plains, we set out a very ambitious plan to get uh, all of our personnel, over 1,200 of them, uh, who are willing and able appointments to be vaccinated. I threw a number out there, like we'd love for 70 or 80% of those people to be able to help them get those appointments and get in, the, get in process. Now, some folks were like, yeah, you're never gonna get that. And uh, you know that wasn't, uh, that wasn't unfair of them to say, it's a high percentage. Well, last Friday, uh, thanks to Kara and David, and thanks to Adele, and thanks to Jennifer, um, and everybody who has pulled together and worked as a community here, we were able to overcome that 100% mark of offering vaccine to everybody in our district who told us they needed an appointment. That is huge. In partnership with the County of Westchester Department of Health, um, with NYSIT, with CSEA and ASA, um, to be able to have offered that to everybody who is, was willing was huge. So just a, a, a round of applause to, to all of you folks who made that happen. I just, uh, I can't say enough. George Latimer, Joe Glazier, Joe McDonald, um, Dr. Amler, all, all of the folks who have been working to support our school districts in Westchester County um, are, you know, are to be uh, commended. The vaccines are still being distributed to school districts throughout the county. That's good news for everybody. Um, you know, some school districts, well, I, you know, I'm going second, I'm going third, I'm going fourth. It doesn't matter when you go. The more people in our community who are given the opportunity to be vaccinated, the stronger and safer it makes all of us. So this is, this is really uh, positive news for Westchester County. Our numbers are on the decline in Westchester County. Our hospitalizations are on the decline. Um, we're moving in the direction we want to move. It's going to be 60 degrees next week. I might as well throw a cherry on top of that, right? Uh, so, you know, it's, it's nice news. Now, New York State Department of Health is, has indicated that they are going to follow um, the CDC guidelines, which we have been following, um, and that they're going to make some clarifying points to the state um, in the coming days and weeks, I suppose. One of those clarifying points is related to um, quarantine for vaccinated individuals. Um, the other is the, the so-called conversation, the push and the pull between three feet and six feet. Three feet and six feet. We need, we need the state of New York to tell us we can go below six feet. They already did. Um, we already have that flexibility and we already have that ability in the guidelines. So White Plains is obviously aware of that. Westchester County is aware of that. Unfortunately, in some other parts of the state, we're still trying to get that word out um, so people understand that it's not an all or nothing, zero sum uh, conversation as long as as long as you are layering on the mitigating factors and mitigating strategies if you're going to go below six feet. So in White Plains, we know that in many instances, not all, but in many instances, our children, in order to be back in school fully, full time, all, ch all kids, um, are going to have to be below six foot of, of physical distance. In some of our classrooms, I have to tell you, we're, we're as you know, um, pretty close, <laughs> depending upon the, 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 the number of students in a class and depending upon um, the, the, the layout of the classroom. What we're endeavoring to do all throughout the district right now is to make sure that we are situating our facilities so that children um, are as far away as possible, um, but at the same time, allowing for 100% of our children to return to school. The layered mitigation 
is everything in this conversation. The first layer, by the way, is vaccine. Uh, but the kids aren't vaccinated. That's true. The kids aren't vaccinated. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but for our faculty and staff members, um, to what'd you do? Mute me, Mr. Did Dr. Rick, I was trying to get Lola in. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> to get that layer uh, of to get that layer of mitigation in there, um, that that was our ground floor. We agreed. Um, so this entire time, we've always prided ourselves on trying to be thoughtful and as smart, as intelligent as we can be in making decisions, conservative where it made sense when we didn't know answers. Um, and we want to continue to, to down that, that same pathway. And, and that's why we, we knew that vaccination was going to be our, our first foundational point. The next foundational point, of course, is making sure that we have the barriers in place in all of our learning spaces um, so that there is this impediment um, to, uh, to any, any uh, particulates in the air that could be potentially spread, including virus particles. Now, of course, our children and um, all of our adults are also going to be continuing to wear facial coverings. Some will, will double up and they'll wear two, and that's great. Um, some will also uh, wear uh, um, face, face shields, and that's great too. Um, by the way, all those will be available to any, any employees who are uh, interested in that. Teachers will also have their, um, their barriers and support staff will also have their barriers in place. Um, and this is gonna go throughout the entire school district. All of the other state mitigating factors that we're still doing, daily health screeners, making sure we're staying home when we're sick, not putting our hands in our mouth, all those good things are still in place as well. Okay, so this is the layering of the mitigation, but what about air ventilation? I'm glad you asked. Um, we, as you know, took the uh, steps to go through all of our unit ventilators at the beginning of the academic year and make sure um, that they were all up to code. We, we replaced all of, all of our filters and made sure we had the appropriate MERV filters in there. So all of our air handlers are changing the air in the room with fresh air um, on a regular basis all throughout the day. So you have that circulation going on. And I know people have been seeing these infographics, the New York Times is posting a lot of them. You have to be really careful when you're looking at these infographics on how air circulation goes. You'll notice in some of those, there are no unit ventilators in the classrooms. So absent an open window, you're not getting airflow, fresh airflow. Well, can we open windows and white planes? Absolutely. And I know many of our colleagues do every day. Well, um, you know, what could we could we add more to that uh, mitigation? Could we add more air purification in the classrooms? Yes, and we're going to do that too. And that's on top of the mitigating um, factors that are in those air purification systems will be coming in over the course of, of the spring and we'll be installing them. Um, they're not a delimiting factor of us being able to phase back in. They're an added um, uh, an added support, similar to tenting. Uh, we talked about tents, and yes, we're ordering tents for all of our facilities. Again, they will be installed uh, in the early spring, and um, it's just a, a, another aspect of, of a, a mitigation strategy that can be used in the school community as the weather gets nicer. So that layer of mitigation has been critical. Now, as children come back into school, the very first thing we need to attend to is the child. And we all know that uh, as teachers and as support staff members at, at the, the core of what we do is making sure that our kids are okay, right? Maslow before Bloom. So, you know, this is gonna be a prime opportunity over the next 10 weeks to re-acclimate our children to the learning environment. Yes, it's gonna be a little bit different with barriers and masks, there's no doubt about it, but the children will be together and the children will get back into the groove of going to school. Some parents and guardians are not going to be ready for that, and there are a variety of reasons for it, um, whether it's a health safety concern at home or whether they just are not yet ready to re-enter their child into the classroom environment. That's okay. We understand that. We're going to continue to provide remote instruction for our children um, throughout the process and continue to support them. Dr. Han's going to talk a little bit more about this in, in a moment, um, but we're very proud of the way in which we're going to approach this, this process for our kiddos, and we think it will be supportive uh, of them re-entering. And I know I've talked to a lot of parents and guardians about their concerns, about anxiety, uh, about coming back to school. Well, first of all, let me tell you this. Children are not alone. There's anxiety about the, these processes, and there has been all year long. Um, and so we need to make sure that as we have in the past, that we're ready to support the kids 
and all of our community members uh, in the future as well related to any anxiety they have. But it's a good time to deal with that if you're able, because the anxiety will still be there in August when it's time to come back to school in September. Now, folks are talking about, well, I think they're, you know, uh, we're going to have hybrid and remote learning in September. You know, school districts are planning for that. I've heard those stories too. It is so important to remind everybody that we are operating under an executive order. There's no such thing as remote learning outside of that executive order. There's no such thing as hybrid education outside of that executive order. There is no reason to think, unless we take a major step backwards, that that executive order is gonna be reauthorized in the same way for September. So folks should, in my estimation, be turning their attention to a full return in September and how you're gonna make that happen. That's where we're looking. Of course, we're, we're looking at a phase full return this academic year, as we talked about from the get-go. Uh, and so that September can start off in a normalized fashion and we can um, move into the 21-22 academic year, um, hopefully unimpeded by COVID-19. Remote learning stability, and as I mentioned, Dr. Han will talk about this, is something we heard a lot about. To the credit of our faculty members, uh, it is something that they were very, are very concerned about. They don't want to leave their kids. They want to make sure that they're able to support their children. We were very intentional about creating classroom environments in the White Plains City School District so that our children, even if they were fully remote, were still part of a classroom community, virtual as it is. We don't want to lose that. I know there are rumors floating around, and for anybody who's watching, please don't um, you know, utilize Facebook as your first go-to for news. Uh, you, you know, the district has never talked about doing anything crazy or radical or anything that would marginalize our children. Sure, we've explored all different kinds of approaches, but very quickly um, came to the re realization that what we want to try and do is sustain that community for our children. And so we will uh, be working to do that. We are gonna be phasing our Tigers back in five days, all children. Schools have been conducting their surveys. Um, we'll have some preliminary data to share with you this morning. Um, but what is the phasing gonna look like, Joe, enough with the setup? Okay. This is what we're looking at right now. And you'll notice it's sort of a, a pyramid in the number of grade levels that are going to be coming back on the scheduled weeks. This is gonna to help to allow, first of all, the acclimation or the reacclimation within all of our classroom environments, in our school environments. It's also gonna allow us to work the kinks and the bugs out in terms of logistics, um, uh, you know, when, we, when we're bringing children back. Um, and on top of it, it's gonna allow us to be able to get our physical plant ready uh, to welcome all of our children back, making sure those layered mitigation strategies are in place prior to the kids coming. So tentatively, and I say tentatively because nothing's ever certain, but I want to make sure that everybody understands this is what we're, we're shooting for with the, with the approval of the committee. Monday the 22nd, um, integrating or phasing back in kindergarten, ninth and 12th. Remember, we talked about that very first week being kindergarten and 12th grade. Well, we had a ninth grade in there after consultation with our colleagues at the high school, and uh, we think that that will be appropriate um, for the first week. And then you go to spring recess. Now folks have said, well, why wouldn't we do this right after spring recess? Spring res recess is gonna do a couple of things. It's gonna provide us with a little more runway to make sure that our facilities are ready. It's also gonna allow our youngest tigers to catch a breath if that first week is anxiety provoking. Um, and at the same time, allow our teachers and our faculty and staff members to also catch a breath, which is so important. The following two weeks, we will phase in the remainder of the, of the school district with the week of April 5th being first grade, second grade, sixth grade, seventh grade uh, for all five days. And then the following week, third, fourth, fifth, eighth, 10th, and 11th. By the week of April 12th, every one of our children will be able to return to school. We're planning for a 100% return. We're not going to have a 100% return, but we're planning for it. We know moms and dads were concerned about, uh, about you know, filling out that survey and sending it back in uh, because they didn't want to get locked into a position necessarily, and we absolutely understand that. Like in the past, we'll work with moms and dads uh, and, and help them to be able to acclimate or reacclimate to the phasing in process. Well, what about the hybrid classes? My kids loved going to class two days a week. It was working for us. I know. 
I know, and I'm sorry that we are not able to attend to that simultaneously with full remote and full in-person. But it's important to note that that moving away from the hybrid is, in my estimation, a mark of success. Um, we always, you know, we always said that the, our ultimate goal was to return our children safely as quickly as we could. Keeping a, a, a third uh, a third modality of, of instruction in place will only prolong the reentry process. So, moms and dads who are you know making a decision, I'm not ready to come back full time just yet. That's okay. You can select full remote, but maybe in two weeks I'll be ready to come back full time. That's okay too. Then you reach out to your child's teacher and or principal and have that conversation about where you are as a family, and we'll do what we can to support. Dr. Hand. Hi, good morning. Thank you for sharing. The wait, Debbie, before, wait, I'm so sorry, Debbie. I just want to thank Debbie and everybody who has been planning with her. Enormous teams of stakeholders spending a great deal of time trying to figure out the best approach, the approach that's going to serve all of our children the best. Um, and Deb, Deb, I know how much time and effort has gone into this, uh, and I just want to say thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I also thank all the teachers and all the principals that have met with me and really worked out a plan that we feel comfortable and we feel that is um, doable and engaging for our children to come back. So although we are still in a pandemic and we understand that, and this has not been an easy time for anybody, we are excited that we've reached this point and that we feel comfortable enough and prepared enough to bring our students back. I don't know if anybody had any questions that they wanted to pose about the schedule that Dr. Ricca had just shared. I mean, I have, you know, I can give you some background of how we looked at different grade levels and why we selected the grade levels that we did. And, you know, I think that Dr. Ricca covered a little bit of that, about that, but if I, anybody on the committee wants any more detail, I can offer that. Are there any questions? Okay. All right, Dr. Rickle had also mentioned that, you know, we really want to make sure that we maintain to the best of our ability, our remote connections with students. And in order to figure out what we were going to do, we had to survey parents to see um, exactly where our numbers fell. So as of this morning, between nine and 9.05, when I checked the, all the surveys for the schools, we have about a 55% response rate and I know that the survey said that they were due today, but please, if there's a parent out there that's watching this reopening committee that hasn't filled out the sur survey, um, we need you to fill out the surveys so that we can get the, the, the most accurate numbers. Of course, we need everybody to, um, everybody to respond to the survey. So if you haven't responded, the teachers will be reaching out to you, or administration will be reaching out to you as well. So with 55% response, we have 80.5 of those responses are in person five days per week and 19.4 are remote only. So we are still running a large portion, not a large portion, it's, it's actually reduced what we currently are, um, but we do have you know, a substantial number of students who are planning to stay in a remote only instructional model. Um, the, the way that the data looks right now is that is, um, You'll see more of that at the high school and the middle school level. The numbers for remote students are higher. The percentages are slightly higher there than they are for the elementary schools. With that said, you know, I know that Dr. Rick mentioned that we'd like to um, maintain the same design that we have for our remote learners that they're connected to their classrooms. I have to say that we've been meeting with the, I've been meeting with the subcommittee, the instruction, the curriculum and instruction subcommittee of the reopening committee a lot to say. And we uh, across the board feel that maintaining this model and maintaining that connection for our students, especially during this time is so important as we move into this last quarter of the year. In order to do that though, we also need to maintain the schedule that we have on Wednesday so that we have a modified schedule and our teachers still have that ability to plan and collaborate so I'm asking um, the reopening committee to really consider the fact that, you know, if we're going to still be connecting our remote learners to our classrooms and our teachers to a certain degree, even though 
our children won't be in a hybrid learning environment. Many of our teachers will still be in a hybrid learning environment, teaching environment, because they'll be teaching children inside their classrooms and children at home. We want to maintain as much of that rigor and the robust structure that we had put in place. And in order to do that, our teachers need the time. I mean, I, I just can't imagine how we would, you know, add that to their plate and not recognize the fact that it requires that much more time and effort and, you know, uh, just organization. And also, many of our children need additional support in order to give that small group additional support. We do a lot of that work on Wednesdays as well as I know that we've talked about Wednesdays a lot in these meetings, you know, our faculty meetings, our department meetings, and, and everything else that has kind of like encapsulated what you need to do outside of, you know, classroom teaching and learning when you're trying to get this accomplished in the pandemic. So I don't know if any, anybody, you know, if any of the principals wanna share their thinking on that. I know that we've talked about it and I, you know, I just don't wanna put anybody on the spot, but Ernie or Emerly or. Yes, thank you, Dr. Han. So, so certainly some of the conversations we've been having throughout this is not only just supporting our teachers with these, with the Wednesday, but also I've had students email me directly and saying how much they value and appreciate that time to, for catching up, to, to connect with other students and, and other groups. So it's really important that we recognize that it's not just our teachers, which absolutely it, it, we need that and we certainly advocate that, but also for our students. So there's a social emotional component to that as well. Uh, and I know, you know, Rena and, and Lola, you're both on here. So I'm sure you can speak to that as well. Yeah, we definitely use it. Like the Wednesdays are really helpful as like a student because like not only can you make up projects and stuff, but when we have group projects and stuff, it's very helpful to have that after school time, but not the evening time. Cause I know in my house, I mean, there's three kids and in our house, we use the evenings for bathing and eating and everything else that needs to be done for the next day. And so it's nice to have that group time that's technically school time, but also not evening time. It's really nice. And as an upperclassman, you know, I schedule college visits, um, admissions talks. I schedule talks with my guidance counselor. Um, I have sectionals for orchestra, along with other study groups and clubs. So Wednesday is a really valuable time for me and my classmates, as well as the teachers. Thanks, Lola. Thanks, Rena. It's important to hear it from a student perspective as well. So, you know, um, you know, Dr. Rick, I'll, I'll turn that back to you about the Wednesdays. But I just wanted to also mention that when we're saying that things might look slightly different, we need to have all of our families realize that when we're bringing all of our children or this, you know, a higher level of density of students back into our buildings, things need to change. Things need to change about our specials program, you know, our rooms for art, for music, especially up at the high school level when you're talking about gathering together your orchestra students that are going to be in school. We are going to have to look to see how we can make those things work and they might look a little bit different depending on the number of students that are in any particular classroom and also you know, the logistical setup of, of our space. Of course, we can say that we're gonna go outside a lot. The weather has to cooperate with us and we also have to have the supervision to be able to do that. But we're gonna do everything in our power to keep everything as close to the same way as it is. So every time that we're saying it may look different, we're just giving a warning that there are times that something might have to look different. Not that we want it to look different, but just because of, you know, the constraints that we'll be working under and trying to really keep everybody as safe as we possibly can. And that's really art, music, physical education, um, some of our art classes, um, you know, where it's really hands-on work. It's not, you're not gonna be able to do that same level of work if you are in back of a partition, you know, sharing materials and things like that. So, and of course, lunchroom and recess and morning entry and dismissal at all of our buildings. Our principals are working very carefully, looking at all those areas with the help of Frank Stefanelli. So again, thank you, Frank. Um, and that's, you know, the, that's really where we are right now. And I think that we're in a great place. I know that we're in a great place. We just, you know, there, there's a lot of logistical work that needs to make sure that we have everything in place and that we're prepared for our students to return. Deb, may I just jump in and say something? Just yeah. in terms of what might be different, just for everyone to recognize that in having the students return in person, we really are kind of revisiting September. Mm -hmm. We are addressing norms on the elementary school. We need to review protocols, not only for safe distancing, but also for how we're gonna interact with each other. 
Um, and it really is going to take a while to set those norms again um, for the larger group. So some of these children haven't been in at all since March of last year. And it's going to kind of take some time to establish those classroom communities and reestablish the protocols and the processes. So just, it may feel like a pause in terms of instruction, but it really is important to set those norms in place so that we can have not only a successful learning experience, but a safe and very structured protocol so that the children can maintain the distance that's required and they know what the expectations are. Good morning, this is Cheryl. If I can also just jump in, um, I was able to listen in um, on some of the uh, recorded meetings that principals and assistant principals had um, with their uh, families. And I really appreciated that it was very clearly articulated um, you know, that things may look different and, you know, sort of, you know, cautioning families um, and, and explaining, although there's a lot of unknown still at this point, I did feel like the presentations were really very clearly, uh, you know, stated to parents that they shouldn't expect things to look exactly the same. And, you know, there will be some, some growing pains, you know, again, um, as we move forward. But I really want to thank everyone um, for all this hugely heavy lifting. Thanks, Thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl. I, I was going to mention the principal meetings too, because, um, you know, since our meeting last week, we have gotten the survey out and our principals have actually scheduled meetings or have already met with, with their parents. And as you said, they are recorded and they're also posted on their website. So I know all the elementary principals have met with their parents. Uh, Daisy Rodriguez met with the Eastview parents last night, and I think that, you know, the Highlands and the high school uh, meetings are, are planned for, you know, the near future. Um, so I have Kara, I think, Deb, I think Kara Lyons has her hand up. Oh, okay. Kara? Hi. So, Cheryl, I want to thank you for bringing that up, that things won't look like what, what they were pre-March 13th last year, and they may not even look like what they are on March 3rd today. So that's really important. I wanna say that we're really excited to have more kids back. We're looking forward to this. We're also really anxious, right? Because this is another, um, another shift. And so what I want to say to my colleagues is we have a proven track record. I want to say that to the parents and families as well. We have done this and we will continue to serve the children of White Plains. There's a lot of anxiety on both sides and that's okay because there are going to be shifts. And I want to really encourage folks at the building level to have those meetings, to look at the specific details, because once we have those numbers, we're gonna, not every classroom is gonna look the same. You're not gonna be able to compare a third grade classroom at Ridgeway to the third grade class down the hall or at Church Street, depending on what the numbers look like. Some classrooms might need additional supports in order to support the students that are at home and the students that are in the classroom. Students might still be on their devices. I don't know what it feels like to teach with those dividers and how that's gonna impact sound, right? With the masks and the students there. So we're gonna be figuring out a lot of stuff and we ask for the flexibility and grace that we were extended and that we will extend to our students. We're really happy to have them, but these are just some issues to consider. Thank you and thank you for advocating for the Wednesdays because they are so important. Thank you, Kara. And we had a question about how Wednesdays would look, just to be clear, and thank you for that question. So the students that would be coming in school to the five days of in-class instruction, they would have a half a day in school on Wednesday and then asynchronous at home on Wednesday. So we're keeping Wednesday, you know, that it's a full day of school, but half of it would be in school, half of it would be asynchronous in the afternoon. And of course, if you're a remote learner, then the morning part would be remote for you and the afternoon would be asynchronous because you'd be joining everybody in their asynchronous work. Um, so students would still be coming in five days uh, a week, only that Wednesday would be modified and it would be a half a day for everybody that was in school. Um, so, and thank you, Kara, for clarifying because you know we keep on saying in all of our meetings, this isn't going to look like pre-March of 2020. It, it's very different than when we than we, um, you know, than before last year when we first went into, you know, our 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 remote only instructional model. 
And it's not gonna look exactly like it does today either because more children will be in classrooms and there will be more mitigation strategies and there'll be fewer remote learning students. But you know that those are the adjustments that we have to make. And I think just having some patience and realizing like Laura said, this is really the start of something new for many of our students. It might not look as different up at the secondary level if the numbers stay stable. It's going to look a little bit more different, I think at the elementary level, but we're here to support all students. Thank you. I see um, uh, Mrs. Eller and I see uh, Lola as well. Good morning, Rosemary and Daisy and Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah, good morning. I'm not going to take too much time. Um, I just wanted to uh, make one statement, but I also wanted to um, hear a little bit about sports and, and with the reopening and uh, how that's going to look for our student athletes. I certainly think it's a, a wonderful opportunity uh, for them to at least be in and be able to, to really move forward in their sports as safely as possible. Um, I also just wanted to also extend um, the thanks on behalf of the board to this this committee. This, you know, we're like at the end game, right? <clears throat> we've been talking about this and, um, you know, this is what we've been talking about all year. I would say that, you know, the vaccine, yes, was a game changer, right? And, and the availability is another game changer and the, the coincidence of the timing. Is a, is a game changer, but I want us to keep in mind that it's going to be great. The vaccine is great for everyone who wants it and can get it. I, I, I think it's great, but we have to keep in mind that there will be some that for whatever reason cannot get the vaccine and some may choose not to because it's all a choice. But for us, and please Dr. Han and Dr. Ricker, feel free to jump in. Safety is our utmost and primary concern for all students and staff. So we look at the vaccine, yes, but we have not forgot that there are other, that there are other segments of, of our um, family, um, if you will, that won't be able to get the vaccine or may choose not to. And we want everyone to, to be safe. Um, also, um, I did have opportunity to speak with Dr. Hand and we did touch upon um, the students that will choose to remain virtual, um, fully remote, right? So, you know, it's a choice, right? And, and our choices are, are, are what we decide to do depending on what our life situation is. And we spoke about that and the, the quality of what will be delivered remotely will not slip at all. It will be the same high quality education um, that we have been providing and we will continue to provide. And because um, a student chooses to be remote, there will be no differentiation in terms of how they're treated. They will be with their, with their, the, the family, uh, the, the instructors that they have had um, throughout the year. Dr. Hand, I hope I got that right or did I mess up? Yes, thank you. Thank okay. you so much. We're, we're, thank you. we're committed Thanks, to all of our students. The one other thing that I wanted to mention is there may be some technology needs that our teachers have. And I want our teachers to know that, you know, reach out to your principals, Ron and Rocco, we're here to support you. Just in terms of like, I'll give an example up at the high school, the teachers feel like having a snowball microphone in their classroom will be very helpful because they're not gonna be able to be at their computer for the audio if they're using the mic from their computer. They need to be able to, you know, navigate around the classroom a little bit and have their voices picked up. So I have a snowball mic now because I went through like a couple of week period where nobody could hear me on my Zoom calls. Um, and it's really been, you know, I keep on using the word game changer, but it has been a game changer. Anything that makes our life easier right now is a game changer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So Deb, absolutely. I just want to share that on the elementary level, we um, ordered amplifiers for our teachers. It's a headset with an amplified microphone that allows them mobility. I don't know what the cost difference is between that and the snowball, but it is an option that's pretty readily available and the delivery time is pretty quick. That's great. great. Thank you, Laura. The that's other great. and the other part of my question was if we could get an update um, on on sports and, and, and what that'll look like. And and I guess, you know, having our student athletes really back in and 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 how we're preparing to to really just get them off onto their college dreams um, athletically and nourish um, the talent. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Sure, Rosemary. And, and I didn't, Lola, I didn't forget about you. And I didn't forget about you, Dr. Rodriguez. Mr. Cameron, um, do you want to just talk a little bit about sports? Uh, for, for folks watching, um, you know, the guidelines for high-risk sports and, and sport, uh, um, sport activities and, and competition um, have remained static. 
Uh, but uh, uh, without a doubt, uh, as we move into the fairer weather, and hopefully it doesn't rain, right, Matt? Um, we we uh, will have a lot of opportunities for our kids. So go ahead, uh, uh, Mr. Cameron. Thanks, Dr. Rick. Thanks, Mrs. Zeller. So yes, uh, sports are sports are uh, a full go at the high school. We just finished on Sunday. We just finished our boys and girls winter track season. We finished our boys swim season and we finished our boys bowling team. Uh, boys and girls bowling team just finished on Sunday. Mrs. Eller, unfortunately, your son's record in the pool was broken. Only one though, there's the three others. I know that, I know that. <laughs> thanks for clarifying. So fall season, uh, winter season high risk sports, they are still going. They go till March 14th. Um, that's boys and girls basketball. We have five basketball teams still going. We have our ice hockey team still going and they'll go to the 14th. We also have all of our students whose seasons are starting have been in the weight room with our strength coach, uh, getting ready for the seasons that are upcoming. So the high risk fall season that starts on Monday and that's going to be our football teams, our girls, volleyball teams, cheerleading, fall cheerleading, um, and girls swimming. They'll start on Monday. And then on April 19th is going to be the spring season. The New York State Championships were canceled. So we were able to push the spring sports season back. And that's, you know, tennis, golf, boys and girls across, baseball, softball, spring track. And we're hoping to run a full complement of our modified sports in the spring, um, which is track and field, boys and girls, lacrosse, baseball, and softball. So that's, that's the plan. And we've been going. Our participation numbers are good. Our, our teams are full. Our teams have been very competitive. We're testing our students randomly, COVID testing at the high school. So we're bringing teams in and individuals in. We've had very, very good results. Uh, we haven't had any positive cases with, with testing with our student athletes. Um, we've had teams that have quarantined uh, for 10 days, unfortunately. And it's really interesting when a team quarantines, um, it, it takes them a while to come back. You see the, the, the impact when they participate against other schools. And, and, and the same as when we play a team that just came off a of quarantine, there's such a difference. Um, it, it takes the teams you know, a while to get their conditioning and the teamwork going. So we're full go. Um, and I think it's, it's, we're doing it safely. We, we put local live in our gym. So all of our basketball games are filmed live uh, and we're gonna be installing our camera out on the field soon. So all of our spring sports and all, all the games on Laps Field will be filmed live. And I think um, we're planning for our sports night right now. And we're getting all of our physicals done this week for fall season two. And any questions for sports? I think um, Lisa Benelli, did you have a, I think she put in the chat um, MS, uh, middle school. Yes, I can't oh. unmute. Yep, just curious about middle school. So middle school sports, we're gonna be going we're going to be running, planning on running our full complement um, of modified sports, seventh and eighth grade sports, starting in the middle end of April. The section has not given us a start date that they've decided to allow modified sports to start in the spring. But I'm going to guess if the high school is the 19th, it's going to either be the 19th or the week after. And then we'll be able to run those into the end of May, beginning of June. Okay. Um, this gives me a perfect segue to uh, Dr. Rodriguez, um, if we can use your gym, we, we have five basketball teams still going and our wrestling team is doing strength training in the gym. So we have six teams using the gym at the high school. We're looking for a gym to use next week uh, for our girls volleyball team to practice from three to 6.30. So I won't put you on the spot. Maybe I'll reach out to you later. And <laughs> okay, we can definitely talk about it. Thank you. And they've been over there doing the workouts at night couple days a week so we thank you for that all right well, thank you it's been great we're sending teams over there and it's you know it's a lot for their staff but you know to do this with social distancing and keeping the kids safe it, it requires that type of teamwork so thanks thanks matt um and and really congratulations to all of our student athletes and their coaches and support staff they've been doing an amazing job we've had records broken we've had champions we've had um, all, all kinds of really outstanding uh, student achievements, uh, Olympic qualifiers, all, all wonderful things. Um, so uh, looking, for, looking forward to that spring season as well. Lola, you have been so patient. Thank you very much. 
I actually have another question for Mr. Cameron. Um, are middle schoolers, like, I know this was already said no to when the other sports were starting, but are middle schoolers going to be allowed to come in to the high school and play on our high school teams? Thanks. Um, as of right now, no. Because, um, you know, things really haven't changed all that much. And our feeling is that we want to get this reopening in the district and at the middle school to run smoothly. And I think that's something that we can revisit uh, for the spring sports possibly. But as of right now for, for football, which we rarely bring middle school kids up to play football. Um, and we rarely bring cheerleaders up to the high school to cheer. So it, the two sports it would impact would be girls swimming, uh, which we already have 49 high school students signed up for. Um, and they're not gonna be able to come every day for social distancing. And then uh, our volleyball team, which, which is rare for us to bring up volleyball players. So to answer your question, no right now, but we will revisit it in April when the modified and high school spring sports start. Thanks, Lola. Thanks, Mr. Cameron. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez. Hi, um, I just wanted to quickly share, we've re we received very positive feedback from parents and from the staff just about our transparency. We've been sharing everything that we don't, that we know and that we don't know. And I think they appreciate just understanding the process and where we're headed. Um, our teachers, uh, we were able to survey them to see some of the ideas that they had and how they were feeling. And the majority are really excited. They're really excited to invite all of our students back. Um, so I thought that was really nice to see that they're excited to be part of the process and they're excited to get back to a sense of normalcy as well. Yeah, that's, that's really fantastic. And I think, you know, to your point, Daisy, I, I really think that we, we are seeing that, um, you know, when we're talking to people, look, everybody, there's, there's a natural and totally normal level of, of anxiousness um, anytime you, you're going to embark on something new. And we've all been through a lot. Um, our kids have been through a lot. Our, our colleagues have been through a lot. So um, I think, you know, what, what I've been so impressed with has been sort of that singular focus on our kids. And it's, it's okay, challenge comes up, we move through the challenge, but we're still looking at and focusing on our kids. What's next? What's next? What's next? And here we are. Here we are on the 3rd of March, where we said we wanted to be. We didn't know a date. We didn't know how necessarily, you know, we were going to, to find ourselves here. But we're here because of all of that careful planning. And, and uh, I know that I, I agree. I think folks really do appreciate the transparency, being able to watch things like these meetings, see the deliberation, hear, hear the conversation and the questions, um, and then that being out there for everybody. Um, there are going to be more questions, and, and we'll answer them. Uh, the principals have done amazing uh, doing Q&As at their building levels. I think that's going to be so helpful to, to moms and dads and kiddos uh, over the coming weeks. Um, we'll, we're, as a reminder, we're going to send out, uh, it's probably all, already all over the news waves, but we will send out the, the phasing schedule this Friday to all of our parents and guardians um, so that they, they have that and they can start planning appropriately. Um, and there will be additional information uh, available. For instance, we're going to do, I'm going to do a, a Q&A this afternoon. Um, and then for any members of, of our professional community, our faculty and staff members, uh, you know, we're going to be available to, uh, to talk through any, any issues that come up. This is 100% a collaborative effort. We started collaboratively, and we're going to finish strong collaboratively. Um, and that's going to be to the benefit of our entire community. Uh, I, I think we have to remember COVID-19 is going to be with us. So as we phase more children back in, um, you know, for moms and dads who are thinking about this, and, and Mrs. Eller brought this up, you know, our, a, a large portion of our community is not vaccinated yet, not vaccinated because they don't have access to it yet, um, not vaccinated because of other re reasons. And we have to be really careful to continue to watch community spread. I know Dr. Longobardi watches it like a hawk. I know Nurse Maggie watches it like a hawk. We will continue to be meeting um, with the superintendents and the Westchester County Department of Health and the county executive every Monday morning. We will go through what we're seeing in the landscape. People have asked questions like, hey, if we have an issue in one of our classrooms or one of our schools, um, will we still have to quarantine? Will there still be isolation um, for the children? And the answer is possibly, yeah. Uh, you know, as we have more children back in, um, hopefully vaccinated professionals won't have to quarantine. New York State's supposed to update its, its guidelines. Um, but there is the possibility that children could get caught up in a contact trace and quarantine scenario. We'll do our best. 
um, but it's still with us. So we all have to be vigilant. Um, and if we see numbers going in the wrong direction in White Plains, we will put the brakes on and we will make sure we uh, address the issue of density if, if needed um, and reconfigure if needed. And that's, I think, is important to say. It's important for people to hear um, because we've never been full steam ahead. We've always been smart and methodical in our approach. And that's the way we're going right now. So I had, I had some people who asked a question. I know Rosemary and, and Cheryl may have gotten these questions too. Well, what changed? How, you know, how, how come all of a sudden we're talking about re-entry? Re well, we've always been talking about re-entry. You know, that, that's always been the focus. What has changed is we hit our vaccination um, uh, uh, goal you know, and making sure that, that we were able to offer those opportunities. That was the big change. Um, what else changed? Uh, we uh, have access and we know we're, we're getting our facilities ready to, to be able to welcome our kids back. So um, lots happening always, but I think, and I hope, I'm hopeful uh, that, that moms and dads and, and our tigers and, and everybody um, will be able to see this and, and start to get into and, and uh, that mind frame of returning back to school uh, in, in the coming weeks. And a couple questions, Adele Herzenberg, hi, Mr. Herzenberg. Good morning, everybody. I would be remiss if I didn't speak about the support staff. What is being asked of them right now is in a tremendous task, especially out of Frank Stefanelli's office, the teaching assistants who are like coming into every classroom, sometimes four or five different classrooms every day as pinch hitters if we're talking about sports. I would like to thank the CSCA support staff and I would ask that all administrators who are watching this take a moment out and check in with them because our mental health is equally important and I cannot thank everyone enough for the job they are doing. Thanks Adele, very well said. Lola. So I don't know if this was talked about in the beginning of the meeting because I came in late, but I know something that when I talk like with my friends or with even my parents and my friends' parents is busing. Like I feel like everyone's really worried about the bus. So maybe we should talk about that or something. Cause I know for me, like my bus is slowly getting more full. Like it's like mm -hmm. they have every other seat across from each other where you sit and it's slowly being where you have to actually walk to the back of the bus to get a seat. So just how are we going to make sure that our buses are safe? Yeah, that's a great question, Lola. And um, we, we, do have, we do have our guidelines for transportation. We're going to do everything we can to continue to maintain that physical distancing on the buses, including if we have to add additional buses to the routes. Mrs. Alfonso is already um, very, very deep into the process of making sure we're ready um, to transport students. We are also uh, uh, reminding moms and dads and, uh, and guardians who are able and who wish to, to transport their children um, as well. That's always a, a, an, op an option, but our buses will run. Uh, and if we need to add more to reduce density, we absolutely will. It's important to, to as a reminder that, uh, you know, students are, are, have the, are gonna have their Zonar cards and we're keeping track of where everybody's sitting um, and following all that layered mitigation um, on, the, on the buses as well. So you're right though, Lola, but the bus is one of those places where six feet um, becomes very, very difficult to attain when you have, um, you know, more students riding um, on a daily basis. But we are, we are uh, watching that as well. Sergio, did I get that? Everything. Okay, Everything. thank you. Um, yeah, hi, Rosemary. I'm sorry, I just wanted to, to say something. Um, I do appreciate Mrs. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez's statement on transparency, and I really wanted to allude back to something Ms. Kessler um, said as well at the last reopening committee. But first of all, um, Dr. Rodriguez, transparency, as you note, is so very important, and that's what um, these meetings provide, you know, that transparency to our community. And it's very important in terms of our equity, equity work because uh, part of our equity work is to ensure transparency. So everyone has the same information so that they'll know, um, you know, what the next steps are and feel included. So I wanna thank you for that. And I also wanted to say to Dr. Hand, um, 
thank you as well because you know I, I do you know I think about our students that are, are going to maintain the full remote schedule and for them to hear through this venue that they will receive exactly what their in-class classmates receive I have to believe that it is a reassuring and most importantly equitable action um, on behalf of, of the school um, district so I do appreciate that and also Ms. Herzenberg took a little bit of what I was going to say but you know I do try to you know when, when parents or whomever talk to me I do try to state the challenges that that we have trying to meet um, every uh, safety measure that we believe is important uh, for our students and staff. And I can only imagine um, from uh, Frank Stephanopoulos, sorry, Frank, office um, trying to order materials that you know you may not get for months, right? And, you know, people may not understand that or it doesn't meet code, you know, there's so many steps to jump through and the persistence to get us the material that we need um, should be applauded. I mean, every single person in every, in every role has really just risen, risen to a level that um, to me is admirable. And again, I thank you. And again, I thank you, Dr. Ricker for allowing me to speak and I won't say anything else now. Well, you, you said it all. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Um, Lisa had put in the chat, can we bring back the school dashboard so families know where we stand? Um, which, which uh, the COVID-19 dashboard? Yes, I couldn't seem to locate it unless it's still present, but- It's I... still there. Oh yeah. Oh okay. yeah, every day, Lisa. <laughs> I, I know, I think it's great because if some of us that are remote now and consider maybe coming back later on, um, yep just yep. so we know where we are, because as someone had said, families unfortunately still can't get access to the vaccine. So as a community, I think as we all become vaccinated, we will all be more comfortable, but it's gonna take yep. a little while. It is, it is. I mean, hopefully the good news is that the projections are that there will be vaccine available for every American by the end. I think they're saying now the end of June, uh -huh. July. Yeah. yeah. And that's, um, that's, that's really great news. So, um, uh, we'll keep an eye. Yeah, we will definitely keep updating the, the dashboard for sure. Well, I appreciate that Lisa mentioned that too, because it reminded me, Dr. Ricca, that we need to be flexible also because there will be classes that will still be quarantined, right? I, I don't think that we can prevent that from happening in, you know, when we bring all of our classes back. So even though a teacher is teaching all of her students in class and might have her remote only students at home, there's gonna be the possibility of that whole class, you know, hopefully not, but it could go um, into a quarantine situation. So we have to be ready for that. We have to be flexible. We have to be adaptive. We have to um, take what we've learned so that we can pivot quickly when we need to pivot so that we don't have an impact on our, our students. So, so I just wanted to mention that because I think in everything else that we mentioned today, we didn't mention that. Thanks, Debbie. Hi, Lola. I just have a question like, I know we're trying to like slide away from the hybrid, like the Zoom meetings and everything else, but if a school does get, not a whole school, hopefully not, but like if a class gets quarantined, would we do Zoom meetings with that class or would Absolutely. we just become fully virtual? Yeah, full remote day it would be, the school day would still go on for anybody who, you know, hopefully wasn't sick or um, was just in quarantine. Yep, that would be the plan to then transition and pivot like Dr. Han said to full remote. So we'll have that available. I am cognizant of your time. I, I want to ask uh, for anybody, and um, let me see the, the best way to do this. If you, if if you're supportive, I'm not I'm not saying you're in love with the plan, but if you're supportive of the plan, the phase in plan, or, and you're willing to, would you give us a thumbs up? Awesome. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Um, just to give you a sense of how quickly uh, the information spreads, right? We're in this meeting. We've been in this meeting for about 60 minutes. I'm already getting hit on Twitter. Uh, is it true? All, all, we'll all be back in school by uh, April 15th. Uh, so it's just, it's amazing uh, how quickly, and, and we will definitely continue to get the word out for everybody. But I have to tell you, I hope you feel a sense of pride and um, accomplishment. We're not done, 
but we've come so far and we would not be able to do any of this without all of you. I will share with you that I was complete rock brain, right? For those of you who are not familiar with my uh, growth mindset, I was complete rock brain related to the schedule. Dr. Hand and my colleagues um, helped move my thinking um, so that I could see how important it was gonna be to approach the phasing this way. Um, I wouldn't have gotten there if it wasn't for you folks. Appreciate that. Um, just like uh, our kids wouldn't be where they are without the support of our teachers. So uh, just a great, great community effort. And uh, we'll be back again next Wednesday, unless anybody has any last minute uh, thoughts, questions, comments, concerns. Dr. Rebecca, if I can just jump in just to say one thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think our K-12 alert system and the social media platforms that many of our families access are terrific. And I just want to say that many of our families do not access them. So oh, yes. while that tends to be a way um, of sharing information in the spirit of transparency, we want to make sure that our families that are not on social media and don't access K-12 for whatever reason have the same information. So I can just ask families to please sign up for K-12. If you haven't as of yet, um, sign up for our PTA pages. That's also a nice source of information because they're missing a lot if they don't have access to these platforms. That's a really great point, Laura, and something that I've learned throughout the pandemic. This is a, something that really is, is a bright spot for me um, because of, I'll use my father as an example, as somebody who's very proud, right? I'm not connected to these types of things. And while I understand that, um, we're in a place right now in 2021 where you don't, you don't need to love these modalities of, of information sharing. But if you're not at least checking one, being the district's website, um, you will miss information. That will absolutely happen. And if you rely on hearing the information second, third, fourth, and fifth hand, um, or exclusively from a social networking website, you're likely not going to get the whole story. So Laura Mungin gives a great point. Sign up for those K-12 alerts if you're not already signed up for those K-12 alerts. If you've not participated in, and filled out your school survey, please do that as well. Um, and if you have any questions about how we can um, uh, better get you information, just let us know and we'd be happy to do that. Um, all right, thank you. Any, anybody else? I think Kelly Biondi has a sales pitch to make for our fundraising. Oh, we, yeah, you gotta fill the stands. Fill the stands, right, Kel? Yes, we have those cutout signs. You can use your picture, download it right off your phone or picture of whatever you want, or you can just do a generic one that's got like the tiger logo. But yes, thank you, Matt. We'd love to, to fill the stands with these cutouts, um, but maybe we could fill the stands with some seniors or something to just give them some sense of community masked and distanced, I don't know. Maybe eventually we could get to that. Mike that, Eaton's in for great. a dozen. What? Mike Eaton's in for a dozen signs. That's, I'm Mike's old swim team coach. That's why I love him. Yeah, but the thing <laughs> is, way back. the thing is, Mike said he's going to do a dozen of Matt Cameron. Is that allowed? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> That's great. Right. We'll take it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. All right. Have a great day. We'll see you again uh, next Wednesday. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the sun.